Dr. Erica Brown, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very honored to be speaking to you. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest on the day of the American election is Dr. Erica Brown, the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership, uh, an associate professor of curriculum and pedagogy at George Washington University. And we're speaking to uh, an amazing, eminent educator who is live from Washington. And uh, you're right in the crux of the matter. What's it like to be living in Washington at this kind of momentous historic moment? Yeah, well, what it's like is being in my study in my basement, basically, because, <laughs> um, you know, although my office in the university is only a few blocks from the White House, and it's um, I walk often, I take walking meetings to the Lincoln Memorial, so I'm really in the heart of the city. Our campus is closed, uh, so all of our work is virtual. But I can tell you that, and I don't think it's uh, limited to Washington, Rabbi, I think that the the atmosphere right now is very, very tense. It's tense in the Jewish community. It's tense in the general community. I just spoke to a rabbi um, from Los Angeles, and uh, and they're moving out their family and boarding up a lot of buildings. Is worry about violence. I I hope I pray that that's overstated, but I think there's a lot at stake in this election, and so um, so it's it's pretty it's pretty tense everywhere. It's an interesting thing. This election, I think, is different to any other. Um, historically, people are feeling very strong on either both the, the Trump camp, the Biden camp, and it's kind of caused, a, from what I understand, a little bit of a split, even within the Jewish community, the Orthodox community. There are those people who say, how can an Orthodox Jew be a supporter of Biden? How can an Orthodox Jew be a supporter of Trump? Can you give us a little bit of background of how did that develop? What's that like on the ground in the USA? And just give us a bit more context. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Uh, Peggy Noonan, who's a wonderful writer and uh, writes in the Wall Street Journal, which is a, a, con a more conservative, left uh, right-wing leaning paper, um, did a, an excellent editorial. I just want to share a piece of it with you. Um, she actually is not voting in this election. Um, she's voting for the philosopher Edmund Burke. Um, and, and she writes about why, even though she's a Republican, she won't be um, voting Republican or Democrat in this election. One of the things that she said is politics has become its own religion for many people. And I think about that a lot. Um, and, you know, we have, it's, it has its rituals, it has its high priests, it has its passion and fervor and extremism. Uh, but uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, we as Jews have a religion already. We don't need another religion. And sometimes I fear that, um, that because Judaism is lukewarm for people, their Jewish identity isn't strong, um, that they gravitate towards politics because it kind of gives them that energy and it gives them something to, you know, it's like a sporting event. But as we know with sporting events, there's a season and the season ends. And my question is, who, what are people gonna do when this is over? I hope they take all of that energy and do some serious exploration of, of Judaism or invest that time into a cause or a nonprofit commitment, some form of leadership. Um, I think it's very odd. Uh, I think COVID has made this much, much harder because when you can't see people, you can't engage in the same kind of compassion you would give, give, you know, give to the other. Uh, there's, there's a lack of empathy, a general lack of empathy, and that's, that's deeply concerning. And of course, COVID has, there's an overlay of COVID on everything. I think the, the stakes are more existential than they've ever been because people's mortality is, is really on the ballot in many ways. Um, and so I think that's where you're seeing some, uh, you've got tremendous support for Trump around Israel initiatives. You've got tremendous anxiety about Trump from some camps, President Trump, because of because of Pikuach Nefesh. And, and I think those are two really big, big issues for the Jewish community. They're not going away. Yeah. You know, I think many of us are shocked worldwide watching the unpresidential conduct of the U.S. election race, particularly yeah. with the debates, the bad mouthing, the slander, ah, the fake news. It. I mean, it's <laughs> almost an embarrassment for the American people to see what's been going on. Yeah, you probably didn't even want us back. I mean, if you could take us back as a colony, you'd probably say, you know, we're done with you. Get stay it. away. Stay away. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Where are your manners gone? Uh, but, but generally, ge uh, genuinely speaking, when we talk about Jewish leadership, and I know you've written 12 books on the topic of leadership, your new newest book about Queen Esther, which uh, talks, uh, remind me the title. Um, it's Esther, uh, Fate. Wait, power, fate, and fragility in exile. Power, fate, and fragility, three buzzwords right now. And yeah. I think this is really, uh, you know, what everyone's thinking about. And my question really to you is, what makes a great leader from a Jewish perspective? What makes a great leader? That's question number one. And question number two, if you could meet any Jewish leader throughout history and travel and meet them, who would you want to meet? 
And what would you ask them? Ah, oh, you didn't give me a heads up for that. Okay. Um, no, that's <laughs> all right. That's good. That's good. Um, so let's take the first question because that's, that's a huge question. And then maybe we'll just run out of time. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think leadership can't be divorced from followership. And I think that's part of what we're seeing as attention today is what does a leader expect of followers and how do you, how do you raise people above where they are? I mean, I think good leadership stretches people to go to a place that they didn't think they could go. I, I don't know who said it, but, and I'm, I'm trying to find, so if anyone listening knows um, that, um, you know, that, that leadership um, makes, it makes the impossible visible, right? So there's something about visionaries and that's not the same thing as managers. Managers make sure that operationally, we're, we can function. So someone um, in education uh, explained it to me this way, and I thought it was really helpful that a great manager makes sure that a school is open tomorrow and a great leader makes sure a school is open 10 years from now. And so if you imagine that our job in the Jewish community from the time of Avraham onward, there was always a concern for succession pipeline, right? Before Avraham dies, he wants to make sure not only that he has a Yitzchak, but that Yitzchak is married and Yitzchak will be um, responsible for, con for Jewish continuity. And I could say as a grandparent that probably the, one of the most joyous expressions of my Judaism is having my whole complement of generations around a Shabbat table and feeling the security that, that something that I care about profoundly and is life-sustaining life will continue for the next generation. And I think that's always been, there's been a Moshe and there's Yoshua. And it was, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm right in the midst of, of, of teaching about Sefer Shoftim. And one of the things that's very striking in my regular shir on Shoftim is that what you have are people who operate tribally and regionally, right? And they're not, they're not thinking nationally, what's good for everyone. And so I think right now you're having this debate among Haredim here and also in Israel, right? What's good for me as opposed to what's good for, what's a Kiddush Hashem, what's good for the nation? Um, people are thinking about that politically. So who are they going to, what are they going to think the day after the election is what kind of country do I want to live in? Not what kind of party do I want to belong to? And I think with Judaism, we've got to think uh, great leadership is thinking, is having that big picture of the dream, where you want to take people, um, finding those who can continue the dream. So the, it, the dream is not all about you. The dream is like, you have to, it, you have to kind of, it's the symptom is, is um, reducing your own um, needs and ego needs around leadership and making sure that that dream continues and, and creates something beautiful in a future you can't see. So I don't know if that's a, an answer. I mean, I think there's a lot of dimensions of leadership. Uh, Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, uh, talks about the liability of charisma. We tend to think of great leaders as charismatic figures, but charismatic figures have often been troubling, deeply troubling in, uh, in Jewish life. So there's, there's wariness around that. There's Fascinating. Wariness. Fascinating. And part two, your, your, your leader, your her her hero throughout Tanakh or throughout Jewish history, it could be modern day, it could be biblical, Mm, well, I think, I mean, I'm going to give, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go with two. Is that, can I do sure. I have two? Sure. Um, I mean, I could give you 10. Um, <laughs> I think, I, and, and, and now I'm having three. I like, it's some, it's some, it's like Yosef, Esther, Golda Meir for me. Um, and I think the reason that I love the Yosef character is, and Yosef, um, there's a lot of similarities as a PhD written comparing um, Yosef and Esther, um, is that you've got two figures who, um, who undergo a lot of deep and profound struggles to find themselves. And in, the, in that process of having those defining moments, they, they create a platform of influence that not only impacts the, them, but, but impacts others. And certainly in the Yosef story, there's also an opportunity for reconciliation by the end of Safer Brashtid. And I think that's important too, is that you, know, you wanna be a person who can have influence on the outside, but your home life is secure and, and, your whole, and it's whole. And I think that's, you know, that's often a problem for leaders is that they've got this magnificent, um, you know, sphere of influence, but at home, they, they don't, they, they haven't, saw, they haven't brought their leadership home, let's say. Um, and Golda Meir, because I guess I have a question for her, which is why hasn't there been another female leader uh, in Israel and why, and could you help me understand how we're going to get one in the United States? 
Um, I think I think she there were critical moments where she made decisions of importance. And I think towards the end of her career, she was absorbed in regret. And I think that that, that to me is also really interesting. You hear a lot, of, um, a lot of buffoonery, a lot of blustering around, uh, oh, I have no regrets, I do it again. Um, I, I, I think if you don't have regrets, you're probably not an introspective leader. It's an interesting thing talking about, about women leadership. You're clearly a, a passionate female leader. Um, but, but what I'm curious to ask you is the last four years during the Trump administration, you know, forget your politics, forget whether you're left or right, or whatever you, you say, Democrat, Republican, whatever you are. Clearly, Hillary Clinton four years ago was the more qualified candidate, right? She'd been a senator. She'd been Secretary of, Secretary of State. She'd led, you know, two major political offices. And... Uh, the fact that she lost must have been a major blow for women leadership generally. And I, I'm just curious to know, how do you think women leadership has been affected by that? And, and what's the way forward to make sure, as you say, we have people like Golda Meir leading us? Yeah. Look, I'm not interested in having a female leader. I'm interested in having good leaders and good leaders come in both genders. And unfortunately, this universe has not fully embraced that. Um, I think when it comes to the last election, you know, it was, it was a shock. Waking up was a shock. Um, it reminded me that there are a lot of people who vote differently than I do, think differently than I do, and that was an important reminder. Uh, it also helped me understand that there's a huge segment of the United States that feels underserved and um, under cared for um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and unheard. And that I think is deeply concerning. People need to feel, your constituents need to feel heard and they need to feel seen. And sometimes the people who make the most noise are the most seen. I think the Clinton, you know, that that came with its own package of, of trouble. And, sure. I, I, and, you know, so I think that there was, I mean, it was, it was hard for me to hear some of the derisive gender-based comments because let's focus on leadership. Let's not focus on pantsuits or your husband's behavior or, you know, so let's, let's, let's be able to talk less. Let's talk about what you, what you bring to the table and what you don't. I think people also wanted, uh, they were tired of politics as usual. So they wanted to try someone who had no political experience. And I think we got someone who had no political experience. And I think, I think he's been able to do, President Trump has been able to do some remarkable things because he doesn't play by the rules, but he's also, um, hurt America in the world because he doesn't play by the rules. So I think, you know, there's two sides of there's two sides of that coin. The political machine is very, very slow. Mm. Um, I, I think there have been more female candidates. And I think that there's, you know, I, I don't like to think in gender terms around leadership. Uh, you know, women are these kind of leaders and men are these kind of leaders. I think they're good leaders of both genders and there are some terrible leaders and they come in all sizes and uh, all sizes and shapes. Sure. I, I, I think, you know, Coronavirus has certainly changed the landscape of everything. And a lot of people out there wondering, how would Trump be facing this election right now had it not been for coronavirus? The economy seems to have been doing well. Things seem to have been up. And this is kind of uh, the, you know, the random event that's come out of the blue that's changed the world. Um, Can I just speak to that for a second? Sure. I've, I'm, I'm in communication regularly with a lot of CEOs and, and directors of organizations. And the thing that I kept hearing in the beginning, I would say like, around April and May, when we started realizing we were going to be in this for a long time, uh, people would say, I did not sign up for this. I, I did not sign up for this. And I was like, life, I did not sign up for this. And it was, it, it, the true test of leadership is leadership in crisis. If you want to get a beautiful memorial um, in, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., you need to have managed a crisis. So if that's FDR or if that's, if that's Lincoln. Um, and so I think that's the real test of the medal of a, of a leader is not, is not something that you anticipated, but something that you could not anticipate. Uh, certainly when it comes, you know, this virus has not behaved as other viruses have behaved um, in history in terms of shifting with the weather. Um, it's taking a long time. The vaccine is taking a long time. And I, I think it, it calls for a different kind of leadership. Certainly one of the things that, that really frightens me, um, and I see it in, um, in segments of the Jewish population, is an anti-science, anti-vaccination, anti-medicine sort of scream. Um, and it's hard for me to figure out how does that 
how, how do we mesh that with the care? It was the deep, deep concern for phys- for one's physical health, for people of nefesh. Um, so, so that that really kind of puzzles me. And when medicine and science become political, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. It's not it's not good for anybody. It's not good for our sure. world. Sure. Here in the UK, things are getting tough. We're about to enter our second lockdown. Yes, you and, are. I hope um, you have some good books. We've got some good books to read over lockdown. Absolutely. I guess really as we go through this ongoing crisis, the world is changing, the new American leadership potentially. How does faith help us? And what's kind of like your closing message to people watching this, this kind of pre-election discussion? Yeah, so I think, thank you for asking. I, I think a lot about Yirmiyahu, um, Jeremiah 29.7, that we're supposed to pray for the welfare of the government. And we're supposed to pray for the government's welfare because our prosperity is linked to its prosperity as we can't we're not separate from the environment in which we in which we live uh we are part and parcel and just as Yumio told us you know plant vineyards and marry off your children and build houses uh you know wherever you are and that's i think the great jewish um secret of longevity is that wherever we are we have figured out how to successfully negotiate our surroundings but it hasn't been by neglecting them it's been by carving out a space in them and so when i think about a character a woman like esther who who the success of the story is as the story ends mordechai is able to do things that are good for his people um, but also good for the countries in that's yosef's success and i think that's that's the message is Whoever becomes president of the United States, and however long that takes, let us have the patience um, and the and the and the peaceful mindfulness to to um, to accept whoever becomes president. But really, we have to pray for the government, as we've been doing it since the time of Yirmiyahu. Uh, we we had a prayer that was presented to Oliver Cromwell and uh, and one to George Washington, and we're still we pray know, for the Queen every Shabbos and St. John's. Pray for the Queen, right? Absolutely. I pray for her too. My husband's English. I pray for her too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, we, that's not a sidebar. That's really, that's really, it occupies a central place in our tefillah and Shabbat. And I think it represents something symbolically about the role that we have to play in the world. So I, I think we, there's a self-consciousness around how, how are we showing up in the world? How are Jews showing up in the world? And, and really the gift to be Makade Shem Shemayim, that our, sure. our job is to, is to take all God's blessings and make them abundantly apparent in the way that we, in the way that we carry ourselves. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, with politics, never let it get personal. Make sure that, you know, Oh, it's always personal. <laughs> it's, it's hard for it not to be personal right now. And I think that's, that's part of the problem. I, I think, you know, I, I, I've said Tachron very slowly in these past weeks, Shomer Goechad. What does it mean? We ask God. It was God, we, we, we pray to God's oneness. We say Shema Yisrael. And we also pray that God helps us preserve our oneness. And so that's, uh, that's my tefillah. And I think all of us need to go into the ballot box with a tefillah. Uh, and it's not a tefillah, a personal tefillah. Let my candidate win. That's, that's important. That's significant. That's symbolic. That, that has implications. But it's really the tefillah of what does the country become the day after an election? Who are we? That's, that's the tefillah that I am holding in my heart right now. Dr. Erica Brown, thank you so much. We look forward to one day welcoming you at St. John's with Synagogue as Scotland residents in the real flesh. Please, God. I look forward to being there once again. Um, <laughs> and I uh, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Thank you so much. 